This week, we are looking at common numbers that we see repeated in Australian currency. When we take a look at our notes and we take a look at our coins, there are some numbers we see quite often. Let's learn what they are and how to spell them. The first number is number one, found in our $100 note or $1 coin. That word is spelled O-N-E, one. The next number is number two. Two is seen in our $2 coin. That word spelled T-W-O. Our next one is number five, as seen in our $5 note or five cent coin. We spell that F-I-V-E, five. The next one is the number 10, as seen in our 10 cent coin or $10 note. Let's spell it T. E, N, 10. We also have a 20 for our $20 note and 20 cent coin. Let's spell that one. T, W, E, N, T, Y, 20. The next number is the number 50 as seen in our $50 note or 50 cent coin. Let's spell it. F, I, F, T, Y, 50. And our last number is 100, or 100, found in our $100 note. Let's spell it. H, U, N, D, R, E, D, 100. Welcome, Pastor Basil. Welcome to The Price is Right. Here we have five different items and each item is on a currency note and that's the word of the week this week currency i want you to see if you can rearrange or put the correct item on the correct currency note second starting from now well that looks pretty big, so I reckon must be hun. Cocoa Pops, they are delicious. Choose 20 or 10 and paint. How much is paint? Cocoa Pops, 10, nah. And, and Pastor Basil, I'm gonna tell you, that's all correct. Ho oh. ho! Hey, well done. Thank you. Hello again, guys. We're continuing looking into money. Last week, we had a bit of a look into what makes up Australian currency. Remember what that word means? It means money. What makes up our Australian money? And these are some of the notes. I just realized that I actually missed out a note when I was teaching you, and it was this one, a $50 note. See, this is what I have to put up with without you guys in the classroom talking to me. So today, and this week, we're gonna talk about taking and giving money. And in order to do that, we do different things in our head called plussing and taking away. For example, Australian money, like a hundred dollar note, doesn't always come in a hundred dollar note. I may get these two notes, which are both fifty dollars. And if I have two fifty dollar notes, fifty plus fifty, I get one hundred dollars. So if someone was paying you for a job, 
Or if your mom was going to give you your money, instead of giving you $100, they might just give you two $50 notes. And you'd be plussing them together to equal 100. Now, it's important to be able to do these kind of problems in our head to make sure that we don't get ripped off when we go to the shops and also that we have enough money to pay for what we need to buy at the shops. If I was going shopping and I wanted to buy some snacks for my mates, but I only had $10, I would have to go shopping and keep in my mind that I only have $10. So for example, I might go and I might want to buy some Cokes for me and my friends, which come to $5. But then I might also want to buy some bags of chips for me and my friends, which come to maybe another $5. So if I've already spent $5, for Cokes, $5 for chips, how much does that equal together? You're right, it equals $10, which means I've got no money left to buy any kind of sweets or lollies. So it's important in our heads to know how much things cost so that when we go to the cash register, we know we have enough money to pay for them. We're gonna look a little bit more about this and we're also gonna talk about not just our dollars, but our cents and our coins in our Australian currency. See you then. Hello fellas! Hello from the Urara Clontarf Academy room, which we hope you're missing like we're missing you. Um, we're back on Urara 2U on ICTV and we've actually got a Clontarf shout out episode. So we're going to give props to a few of the lads that have been sending in videos, photos, doing great work back in their community and we want to be able to do this every week or two. So this is your challenge to start posting some stuff on our Urara 2U Clontarf Facebook page. And our first shout out's gonna go to the Jones brothers. Keeping up with the Jones is not always easy to do. Not. But Javen and Leroy responded to Shailen's basketball challenge. Leroy got one in from halfway, and Javen managed to swish one from the three point line. They got a video into us, you too can do the same thing. Here's the fellas. Amazing work from those fellas, well done. And we know there's lots of great stuff happening out across the communities. Um, send it in fellas, send in the evidence so we can shout you out on TV. Um, one thing you might be able to do is to keep your eye on upcoming episodes and a new feature that Clontarf is doing called Show Us Your Colours and Stan will talk a little bit about what that is. Yeah, you can all contribute to that. We're all gonna get out a footy jumper, could be a basketball singlet, maybe a rugby league jersey, but uh, something that means something to you. Could be your favorite team or, or a team that you played for. Sit down, show us your colors, and you only have to talk for about 30 seconds, but just tell us a little bit about why that means something to you. Pretty easy one for everyone to do, so uh, get it into us and then we'll get it back out to everyone. For sure. All right, lads, that's us signing off. Shout out episode. Show us your colours. Keep your eyes on the next few episodes and keep safe. Go See you soon, Brumbies. everybody. And the Brumbies. Olaf had thought of some describing words. He couldn't wait to get on the phone and describe his community to his friends and family in the city. The first person he called was his cousin Kristoff. Kristoff is tall and slim. He has dark brown, curly hair and a massive smile that stretches across his whole face. He loves to play basketball and is often wearing a basketball jersey and shorts. He has an outgoing personality and a good sense of humor. He is a little bit older than Olaf, so he always likes to be kind to others so he can set a good example for his little cousin.
After Olaf used these describing words, Christoph said that he could now imagine what it is like at Olaf's community, and he hopes to go and visit one day. Hello everyone. We're still doing descriptive writing, but we've finished with the setting, the where the story happens, and now we're going to do characters, the who in the story. Character's just another word for person. Now characters are important because they are what makes a story. Without characters, there's no story to tell. You'd only have the setting, the place, the country. So in this lesson, you'll be describing two characters. One of them will be you. Oh, so you're going to have to tell us the name and then talk about their hair, their face, their clothes, what they wear. Do they have any pets or animals? Do they carry things around with them? What characteristics? What are they like? And who do they have in their family? For example, when you do the two characters, one will be you, but your other character might be strong or kind, a fella, an uncle, a young lady, a grandmother. It's going to be up to you who's in your story. Now, characters can change throughout the story. They may learn a lesson or grow up in other ways. Think about Elsa. She's the character in our story. What do we know about her? She is young and lives in a community. Her hair is quite long. She doesn't wear glasses and has a nice smile. Elsa often wears blue shorts and a striped t-shirt. She is slim. We see a dog in the story. Is that Elsa's? She has a nice backpack, which she took with her when going out bush with Miss Deb. Most important are her personal characteristics. She is kind, friendly, thoughtful, respectful, easygoing, an all-round good girl. The words help us to imagine Elsa, and that's what you'll be doing in your worksheet this week. Now for our wow words. Wow. Words of the week. Character. Car. Ak. Ter. Appearance. Ap. Peer. Ants. Excited. Ex. Sight. Ed. Strong. Strong. Kind. Kind. Height. Height. Clothes. Clothes. Today we're going to make elephant toothpaste. So there's a few ingredients we need to start with. We need some dishwashing soap, detergent, if you'd like to call it. We need some yeast, you can get this at the local supermarket. We need some food colouring, I've got three colours here. And just some hydrogen peroxide. And again, you can get that at the local supermarket or chemist. I've already mixed the yeast up already. You need to just mix it in warm water to make it dissolve. Just give it a stir as well and I'll add the colouring into the solution. So I'll start by pouring the hydrogen peroxide into the jars. I'm just going to add some food colouring. And some dishwashing detergent and give it a bit of a stir. 
And what this will do, as the reaction takes place, it makes oxygen bubbles and the oxygen bubbles will catch, hopefully, in the dishwashing detergent. That's our elephant toothpaste. This experiment is a reaction between hydrogen peroxide and yeast. When we added warm water to the yeast, it activated it. Then we mixed the hydrogen peroxide with the soap. Nothing happened yet because neither is reactive with the other. When we added the activated yeast mixture to the container, it immediately created a foam that bubbled out. During this reaction, the hydrogen peroxide is being broken down and split apart by yeast, which is acting as a catalyst. The hydrogen peroxide breaks down into water and oxygen gas. To show how hydrogen peroxide broke down into water and oxygen gas, we added soap, which caught the gas and created the bubbles. This reaction also creates steam and heat. The mixture heats up to do the reaction between the yeast and the hydrogen peroxide. This means our reaction is exothermic. An exothermic reaction creates heat by shifting energy from the reaction to the surrounding area. Oh, yeah. that, eh? Can you remember what that is? No, yes. Well, what? Oh, no, I can't believe you can't say that. Wait. Yeah, yeah. What? Can I put in the yeast? Yep. Swirl it. Just give it a bit. Yummy, yummy. Alright, let's see what this one goes. Looks like what? Yeah. Swirl it. Hey, that one went a bit more, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> What is that, salmon pink? Yeah. And good afternoon everyone from the beautiful Anzac Hill right here in the heart of Alice Springs. This is Health and Wellbeing with Mr Zane and Mr Liko. Over the past few weeks we have looked at some choices that you make here at school and also back home in your communities and how some of the choices that we make affect our well-being. Can you remember the first part of our well-being we talked about last time? That's right. It is social well-being. Well today, we are very excited to introduce to you the second part of our well-being. If you take a look at our well-being model, we will now move on to physical well-being. Today, we want to teach you, our students, about what physical well-being is. We also want to help you understand about how the choices that you make can impact your physical well-being. When you think of physical well-being, 
What ideas come to your mind first? You might be thinking something like this. Or this. Or this guy. But did you know physical well-being means much more than that? Mr. Zane will break it down for us. Oh, that's right, Mr. Liko. There's more to it than just having big muscles. Physical well-being is actually our lifestyle choices to help us to improve our health, avoid getting sick, and living in a balanced state, body, mind, and spirit. To help you understand, watch these short clips of the choices you would normally make here at school and think about how this might relate to your physical well-being. Let's take a look. Next time, we will continue to look at the meaning of physical well-being. We will focus on what this looks like in our daily lives and how the choices you make can impact your physical well-being. We look forward to seeing you next time. Stay tuned. This week in Word of the Day, we will be looking at some animals. Our first animal is... Ava, meaning kangaroo. So make sure and practice saying... Ava. At home. And even get your family to have a go at saying it as well. We'll see you next time. Bye. Ara. Ara. Ara.
Yeah, good, thanks. That's good. Where are we heading to this time? Just past Alice Springs Airport, there's a sign that leads to where we're going, Santa Teresa. Santa oh, Teresa. Yes, I know the one. I've never been there. I'd love to go. Yeah, there's some very interesting things happening. Oh, wow, that sounds great. Have you got your bags packed? Surprise! Let's get the show on the road. Hi everyone, Tiffany here. I'll be your tour guide for today. Santa Teresa is 81 kilometers southeast of Alice Spring. The language they speak at Santa Teresa is Eastern Aranda. The Eastern Aranda name for Santa Teresa is Chinjabora. At the Santa Teresa Church, they have church service on Sundays at 9 a.m. On Monday mornings, the students from the school have the assembly in church. The swimming pool opens after school during the summer. This cross was put on the hill so that if people broke down on the road, they could look to the cross and find their way home. Hello, I'm Mr. Daniel. The things I like about Santa Teresa there's quite a few to be honest. Having a family there, it's good to go out and visit them. I like the people in the community, they're all very welcoming. Even if you're non-indigenous or indigenous, you're not from there, you can still go there and they will still have a good conversation with you. I like the art centre, where my cousins and that work. Obviously you can't forget about the footy oval, which is, you know, I've played on there a fair few times, um, pretty good. But I'm, I'm excited about the green grass coming there. It's going to make the place look pretty bright and colourful. The Melbourne Demon Footy Club, uh, they go out there every time they visit Alice for their footy around here. And they have horse racing. My cousin's won that a few times. And she has a lot of trophies for it. <laughs> My favourite. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, the good old horse racing. This is an aerial map of Baranga. Well, Bamili they called it in those days, yep. and I was here for two years. And as you go into Baranga, there's a hill, and over the rise, looking up, you can see all the teachers' quarters. And looking down into the valley, the indigenous community was closer to the school. My house was right in the centre. Then there was the school. This school was from primary right through to high school. There were two enormous mango trees, 30 metres tall, and the mangoes, the ripe mangoes, would drop onto the ground and they were always eaten very quickly. Because it was quite warm there, after school, a lot of us would go swimming with, uh, with the kids in the creek, which was only a 10 minute walk from our school and we would just lie in the, the creek waters or swim in the pools of water just to cool down and it was very refreshing. An amazing place. It's so good to see all these different communities and uh, what they're like. What have you got at your community? We've seen Mickey J create communities using sand, but we would love to see what you can do. Take a picture or video and send it in to us. Is my hair alright or am I having a bad hair day? Am I in the right spot that way? Good, thanks. <laughs> Sorry, I'll have to do it again, that fly. I'll do it again. No, just, no. Leave, just leave it rolling. We hope that you enjoyed watching this episode of Urara to You. I know that the staff are having a lot of fun making them for you. My favourite part of this episode was seeing Levi and Javen make those basketball shots. Be sure to tell us what your favourite parts of the show are. Keep safe, keep well and keep watching your own. Good morning! Hey, hey. Welcome back to Urara! <laughs>